JavaScript programming usually is done through the use of frameworks, such as React.js, AngularJS, and Ember.js. These frameworks abstract away some of the messy details of JavaScript and simplify web development so that engineers can build products at a faster pace. When we build software using JavaScript frameworks, we are missing out on some of the richness of the JavaScript language itself in exchange for faster software development. Kyle Simpson is the author of You Don't Know JS, a series of books that suggests that JavaScript developers should start from the ground up, not from the top down. By learning the basics of JavaScript, a software engineer can learn the timeless fundamentals that will not disappear with the creation of next week's hottest framework. After exploring the idea of frameworks versus raw JavaScript, Kyle and I discuss asynchronous JavaScript, from concurrency to the observer pattern. If you enjoyed today's episode about Software Engineering Daily, please share it on Twitter or Facebook. Tell your friends about your favorite episode. That's how this show grows, through word of mouth. You can also send me an email at softwareengineeringdaily at gmail.com. I am always looking for criticism, new show ideas, just people saying hi. Thank you for listening to the show, and I hope to hear from you soon. Software engineers never stop learning. If you are listening to Software Engineering Daily right now, you enjoy learning so much that you listen to a podcast about technical software topics. IT Pro TV has videos for people like us, people who never stop learning. I'm using IT Pro TV right now to learn about Amazon Web Services, and I found 10 hours of high quality videos about EC2, elastic load balancers, orchestration, cost management. If I ever decide to start my own tech company, I will need to know how to manage the cost of my servers. Go to itpro.tv slash sedaily to get started with a free seven-day trial of videos. You can then use the promo code sedaily and get a 30% discount, and that discount is permanent. Watching these videos, I have learned how to configure auto-scaling groups together with load balancers, I've learned how to configure a database that can scale up without inconsistencies. If I wanted to test out of the Amazon SysOps certification right now, I could. There are also courses about Microsoft operating systems and networking, VMware virtualization, Cisco routing. You can watch 70 hours about Cisco routing and switching, and it is engaging and entertaining material. If you listen to Software Engineering Daily all the time, this is the kind of material that you will love. You can put it on in the background, and you will find yourself just absorbing the information without even realizing it. You can try it free for seven days. Go to itpro.tv slash sedaily. Use the promo code sedaily to get 30% off, and after you try it free for seven days, I have no doubt that you will want to continue to invest in yourself and your future. Thanks to IT Pro TV for sponsoring Software Engineering Daily and for producing this top quality content. Kyle Simpson is a web evangelist and a published author uh, of several books about JavaScript. Kyle, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thank you so much for having me. The first book in your You Don't Know JS series is called Up and Going, and it's a great introductory introductory book to both programming and to JavaScript itself. And this book is it's great and it's free, so I encourage anybody who's listening to check it out. One main point of the book is that you encourage people to dive deep into the finer points of JavaScript itself. So on this show, we've done tons of interviews about React and Vue.js and Angular and these other frameworks, why do you encourage people to learn JavaScript itself rather than the frameworks? Yeah, it's a great question. So as you as you mentioned, there, the series of books, there's six books in the series. Uh, the series of books is designed specifically to challenge the popular notion that seems to be quite prevalent in our industry, um, challenge the popular notion that it's enough to just know enough JavaScript to get a feature implemented. I have a feeling that many listeners have probably been in that same position. I certainly have in many, many years in my career, not understanding what I was doing, but it just sort of worked. And 
I like to call that a uh, house of cards development, sort of set something up, get it to work and hold your breath as you back away. Maybe put a little comment there that says, don't touch this because I don't really know why it's working. So please don't mess it up. Um, and so that is a, is a prevalent thing. It, it comes from the nature of the language itself. JavaScript has this two-edged sword um, that it is so easy to get started with the language, which is its greatest strength. It's the reason why the language won the ubiquity wars. It's the reason why it's become the, the lingua franca of the web is because it is so easy and it's so accessible to so many people, easy to learn. But the other side of that sword in that cuts pretty deeply, I think, is that the language is far too easy to learn only a surface level understanding, uh, to use a framework, to apply something, a library, a jQuery, not critically thinking about what's going on underneath. Now, I want to be careful to say I'm not suggesting that every person have to be a framework or a library level author to be a uh, you know, valid JavaScript developer. But I do think that it's important for us to understand at a competence level the tools that we use. And for us, that, that, that tool is JavaScript. Even if you call yourself a React developer, React is just JavaScript. Um, it'd be a little bit like driving a car and having absolutely no uh, notion in the slightest of what was under the hood. You don't even know that there is an engine. You don't know how it works. You don't know that it runs on gas. You don't know that there's electricity that runs the radio. If you had no intuition about those things at all, you could still drive the car and you could probably be pretty successful at it. But that's the happy path when things go well. Um, mm. Many of us developers probably identify with the not so happy path when things don't go well. And in that metaphor of owning a car, if you went to the repair shop and you literally just kind of threw up your hands and said, I have no idea. It broke. I don't know. Uh, you're at their mercy at that point. On the other hand, if you had some competency to say, you know, I think it's the brakes, they seem to be squeaking, and I think it's the brakes, then you can narrow down and start to have an intuition about where the problem might be, and be able to reality check against what a repair person is telling you. That's the level of competency that I encourage everyone to get to with JavaScript. Can beginners learn this route effectively, can they begin learning to program even with just raw, raw JavaScript rather than, than frameworks? Yeah, because I actually have a different definition for what a framework ought to be. And this part will be a little controversial. It's not new. I've, I've said this many times publicly, but I don't think the purpose of a framework is to learn the language, as most people do. I think the purpose of a framework is to assist you in rapidly prototyping. So if it's not to learn the language, but to assist with one particular part of the development life cycle, then what we have substituted for learning is what I would refer to as basically just rote memorization. I don't really know how it works, but I know that I've done it before. I know I can copy and paste this thing in and it'll repeat itself the way it did the last time. And we sort of take that as good enough. And I don't think good enough is actually good enough. For us, for those of us that want to take being a JavaScript developer seriously. Well, so you make a great point that, you know, JavaScript itself is a great language to learn. But JavaScript frameworks are a higher level of abstraction than raw JavaScript. And if, if you are going to suggest that people should focus on raw JavaScript, is that to say that you could just go further and encourage them to an even lower level, that they should learn assembly language, that they're not actually, you know, they're not going to know what's actually going on unless they know exactly the physics of what's going on in the processor. How deep does that argument go? Yeah, that's a that's a real common argument. People say, well, let's just all go back to assembly. That's the, the slippery slope um, logical fallacy. So I certainly don't advocate that unless you know machine language, you can't be a developer. Um, what The way I choose to articulate it is this. If we look at the history of computer languages, they have been classically divided into generations. And depending on who you talk to and what Wikipedia page you read, JavaScript sits somewhere either in the third or the fourth generation of programming languages. When I was first learning it, it was more called a fourth generation language, and now it seems to be more referred to as a third generation language. But whichever place you, pl you put it, there are these distinct divisions, and it's pretty classically understood that machine language being the first, uh, you know, an assembly, 
And then above that in the second generation being languages like C um, and so forth. So um, using that as our guide, I think that whichever one of those generations you choose to make your career in, and some people, of course, cross boundaries, but if, if we're talking about specifically a developer that focuses on JavaScript, whatever generation you're in, I think that you should first seek mastery of that generation and a competence at the generation below it, a competence of understanding. So I, as a developer, would not consider myself a C programming expert. But I do understand a little bit about what C is doing. And that assists, especially, for example, in the Node world, a lot of the libraries that are exposed in the Node's you know, system, like the file system commands, those are all POSIX-inspired APIs, comes directly to us from the tradition of C programming. So having some competence understanding in that layer allows me to understand what I'm doing better. I don't have to be a C expert or an assembly expert or a machine language expert. But I should know the layer that I'm at and be competent with the one below. Now, when we talk about within those layers, within those generations, we talk about all of these magnificent libraries and frameworks and even platforms that are created within them. And I think the same principle applies at the micro level as it did at the macro level, meaning at whatever generation or, you know, whatever part of that layer, whatever strata you choose to play at, you should be extremely familiar with that and you should be competent at the one below. So if you intend to make your entire career as a React developer, um, then you should fully and completely and totally understand React. And you should have a solid fundamental competency of the layer below that, which in this case would be JavaScript. If um, you are choosing to make that decision, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say that one of the reasons why I encourage people to really learn JavaScript itself and make that be the, uh, a focus of your foundation of learning is because those of us that have been around long enough know that there is no silver bullet where we've just we've been waiting around for decades for somebody to invent the perfect approach. And now we've, you know, a lot of people think React is the thing, but I promise you three years from now, we'll be on a podcast and we'll be talking about some new thing that's even better than that. And hmm. some new thing several years later, these cycles repeat. I've seen it four or five times just in my career. These hmm. cycles repeat. So um, the thing that is true across all of those cycles is that having a better understanding of JavaScript allows you to better make those decisions about how and which tools to use. Hmm. Right now, a lot of developers make the decision to jump on React or Angular or whatever, mostly based on signals like how many GitHub stars does it have? Uh, how many votes did it get on Hacker News? That sort of thing. I don't think those are actually very good signals to make such important decisions. Hmm. I think uh, the best signal that you can make is to actually understand the... Uh, the mechanics of what your application is going to need to do, and then be able to look at the source code of a framework or library that you're choosing or even platform and see whether or not there's a good match. So I don't tell people, go make your own React, but I do think that you ought to be able to open up the source code for React or for Angular or whatever and understand every single line of it. And if you can't, that's the place where I would recommend more and deeper learning. So if I'm a brand new programmer, the biggest risk is that I start programming and I get frustrated and I don't see the results from my programming quickly enough. I write hello world, that works. I write some math functions, those work. But I don't get to an app quickly enough. Like I feel like for a beginner, what's you know getting on board, the re the most important thing is to see, some positive results really quickly. And the best way to get those magical positive results is to get that massive sense of leverage that that modern programming can can bring a developer. So it would it make sense for a brand new developer to to start with a with a framework in the sense that it just gets them going faster and it gets that positive feedback loop going. And then, you know, maybe when you get to an intermediary level where you're like, okay, I've built some apps with this framework, then it makes more sense to to delve deeper into the source code of the framework. Yeah, so first I would start by uh, challenging the notion that you just asserted, which is, quote, the most important thing is, and you filled in that blank by saying, getting some quick wins, essentially. 
I don't think that's the most important thing. I don't think we have historical precedent that teaches us that that's what produces the most long-term and productive and effective developers. Um, I think what does actually produce the most long-term, effective, um, useful developers to the ecosystem is a love and a curiosity to understand everything that they do at a deeper level, at an uncommon level. I think history bears out that those are the people that have made the biggest and most sustainable impact. So I don't think that quick wins are actually the thing that we ought to focus on the most. At the same time, I do understand human nature is to say, uh, if I can't understand something quickly enough, then I can't, you know, I can't keep my patience level up. So there's a balance here. Um, and to understand that balance or how I would articulate that balance, we actually need to address I think, a misunderstanding around the terms of libraries and frameworks and platforms. Um, a lot of people throw around the term framework, and then they use that word to describe something equally like React and Angular and jQuery. And those are three very, very different things. And I don't think all three of them deserve the term framework. So um, my, my uh, answer or my way of articulating this would be to kind of artificially draw three categories, library, framework, and platform. And I'll start by giving you a metaphor and then come back to uh, where I slot things in there. But uh, the metaphor is this. Um, if you're in a car and you need to get from point A to point B, the old school way, and I'm dating myself here, of course, but the old school way of doing that, if you need to know how to get there, is to pull out a folded paper map out of your glove box and look at the roads and figure it out. And that map then is a tool that allows you to figure out the answer and get to where you need to go. But it doesn't have any opinion or any guidance for you on the right way to do that. It just provides you the information and assists you, but it's a passive tool. Um, it was good enough for many hundreds or even thousands of years, but it's not the best that we can do. So then we started creating more advanced navigation tools. So the second level then would be GPS systems in our cars. You put in point A and point B, and the GPS system, the navigation system says, this is the best way to get there. I've taken into consideration all the traffic and weather and all that other stuff, and I'm gonna tell you this is turn left here. Um, you're still not required to turn left. If you know that that road is shut down and the navigation system doesn't, you can turn right instead you have the option of going outside of it, but it's going to be very vocal about its opinions, about how it thinks that you should get there. Um, that tool, you know, GPS systems, that's at the second layer. And then at the third layer is a self-driving car. You sit down, put in point A and point B, and step away from the steering wheel, and essentially you get what you get. It's going to take you there the way it thinks you should get there, and you're not really gonna have an awful lot of say-so in the matter. You kind of take it all or nothing. So if, if those are our three layers, metaphorically, let me relate them back. Uh, the folded map in the love box is like a library. And I put things like jQuery, and even to some small extent, something like Backbone. It's kind of on the edge, but I would put jQuery firmly in the category of library. It is a passive tool. It has a lot of usefulness, and I still endorse and use and even teach jQuery. But I don't endorse and uh, encourage you to use it blindly and not have any intuition, especially if you need to uh, optimize for performance. Then at the second layer, and again, all these lines are artificial, so there is no hard and fast one or the other. But at the second layer, we start to talk about frameworks. And I would say that React is somewhere between the library and the, and the framework. It firmly straddles the line between the two. Angular is much more firmly in the camp of framework by this definition. Uh, Vue and the others, you know, you can probably start to get an intuition of where you can slot those things. Hmm. Uh, and then if you look at something like Ember, for example, um, I think it's fair. I, I have several friends in the Ember space. I have a lot of admiration for it. But I think it's fair to say that Ember is verging on the line between framework and platform. Ember has moved much further along the lines, very similar to Rails, it's become more of a, you kind of just, there's like one right way of doing things. And it's not really a good idea to go outside of those lines. And everybody has adopted the one right way of doing it. 
So you could compare something like Ember to something like Backbone and see very clearly that, the, that there has to be some gradient here. In the Backbone world, um, I always used to joke, you could line up 10 Backbone developers and get 11 different answers for, quote, what makes a Backbone app. But if you lined up 10 Ember developers, you're pretty likely to get almost the same story of what makes a good, well-architected Ember app. They've made a lot of those decisions through a lot of really good intelligence and experience. And when you choose the Ember ecosystem, you, you're essentially choosing a platform that is going to guide you on the right path and deviating from it an awful lot is probably not the most effective. Hmm. So if those are our three categories, tools like libraries, frameworks that are more opinionated and platforms that really are very strongly opinionated in guiding you, I think the most effective thing for people to use to get those quick wins, going back to what you asked a few minutes ago, is to learn libraries, to learn hmm. tools, and use those effectively to get over the things. Not to use them blindly, but to use them. Uh, but I don't recommend graduating immediately to frameworks because I think that that skips far too much of the fundamental foundational learning. I want to get into talking about some of the richness of JavaScript that you have really uh, devoted a large portion of your career to delving into. You write that uh, full-scale production JavaScript often barely scratches the surface of what the language can do. What, what are the aspects of JavaScript that are not utilized as often or uh, as thoroughly as they could be? That's a great question. First, I'd say there are, there's a category of things that are used and are not articulated or understood. Um, so in that first category, the most uh, obvious um, uh, thing to be included would be the closure system. Understanding the full aspect of what closure means and how it plays out in all of its di different uh, facets. Uh, most people use closure all day, every day, and have no idea that they are doing so. Uh, so that is one category of things. And I think there's an awful lot in JavaScript that people uh, don't. There are several other things that belong in this other category, which are things that are, um, one, not understood, and two, not used because they're not understood. Um, and I would have two that I would put in that category. The first, again, a little bit controversial. I'm not, uh, I'm not, it's not common that people will be proponents of the type system and the coercion system in JavaScript. I'm actually a big proponent of it. Um, I recommend uh, learning it and understanding it and using it more effective uh, to make to create more effective and more readable code. Um, so I don't buy all of the the uh, arguments that it makes bad code and it's a flaw and should be avoided and all that. I think all that's uh, that comes from a lack of understanding, not from uh, a, an abundance of understanding. But the other mechanism that I would say, which I think is completely misused and therefore underutilized as a result is the prototype system. Um, this is an age-old debate around JavaScript about does JavaScript have classes, and if it does, what does it look like? And we really didn't do ourselves any favors in that discussion by adding a keyword called class because the actual practice of it wasn't to implement what is the classical understanding of classes. And by classical, I don't mean um, every single language is exactly the same. I do understand that there are many different uh, theories on class, but most developers that come to JavaScript do end up coming to JavaScript through uh, one of a few kind of, I would say, gateway languages, C++ and Java being two of the biggest. And in C++ and Java, there's a pretty clear understanding of what class means and what inheritance means and what polymorphism means and those sorts of things. And JavaScript's implementation of that is very different. It's not just a little bit different. It is polar opposite. Um, and I've, I've spent an, an entire book in the series, the This and Object Prototypes book, making the case that they're completely opposite systems. That's not that prototypes are JavaScript sort of bastardized version of classes. In fact, the prototype system embodies an entirely different design pattern than classes, and that design pattern has a name. It's not something I made up. There's a Wikipedia page for it. It has a name, and that name is Delegation. And I think we have spent the last 20 some odd years of JavaScript so enamored with the notion and the design pattern of classes 
that we keep layering on more and more syntax and more and more libraries and more and more frameworks and more and more new syntax to try to convince ourselves and lie to ourselves that what we're doing is classes in JavaScript. And we have completely missed out on the fact that there's all this power in the delegation pattern. Um, there's an observation that is made, not unique to me, but I'll simply quote it. Uh, an observation that is made if you compare delegation uh, versus inheritance. Some people say those are just two sides of the same coin. I think they're entirely different. It's like a coin and an apple. But uh, the comparison that's been made or that's been observed about this is that um, delegation is a more powerful design pattern and construct than inheritance. And the, the basis for that assertion is that you can implement an inheritance system in a delegation capable language, but you cannot do the reverse. You cannot implement delegation in an inheritance based language. JavaScript is a delegation based language. It's a prototype delegation based language. It's one of only two languages that I'm aware of that actually allows you to create objects without classes. The other one being Lua. And I think we've been drunk on this notion of classes for far too long and missing out on all the power that we could embrace if we really understood prototypes and implemented the delegation pattern more. Hmm. Very interesting. Uh, the, uh, another thing that you talk about in some of your material is concurrency. And concurrency in JavaScript is a topic that could get us closer to some other elements of the richness of JavaScript that I'd love to discuss with you. First, could you define the difference between concurrency and parallelism and how that applies to JavaScript? Yeah, that's that's great. Um, and those that listen to me know that kind of one of my uh, pet uh, obsessions over the last several years, and I don't see it changing anytime soon, has been trying to wrap my head around uh, the effective teaching and application of asynchronous programming. So... Um, I think it behooves us to go back to some of the fundamental concepts before we're talking about the syntax. And one of the most uh, fundamental of those concepts is this distinction that I think should exist between what concurrency means and what parallelism means. It's not that they are two different things. It is that uh, parallelism is a type of concurrency. It is only one type of concurrency. So to understand that, we have to understand first what concurrency is. Concurrency... Uh, most simply defined, in my opinion, is that two or more sets of operations are being processed in the same period of time. Uh, for example, you could be making an AJAX request and a response, and you could be scrolling the page and repainting the position of the visible page. Those are two sets of operations that have multiple steps. Some of them are synchronous, many of them are asynchronous, and those are progressing at the same time. If they weren't, if you had to literally block, then you would have a blocking AJAX request and response that would take several seconds and you couldn't scroll the page while that was happening. And many people probably are, you know, or at least some people are old enough to remember synchronous AJAX requests where it literally locked up the browser. Okay, so that would be the definition of anti-concurrent if you had one task that completely hijacked everything and nothing else could happen at the same time. Concurrency means that A and B and the steps of A and B are interleaving themselves over the same period of time. Parallelism is a way to model concurrency, and parallelism literally says at any given instant, not a period of time, but an instant, two, thing, two or more things are happening at that exact same moment. The way parallelism is modeled in parallel capable languages is most commonly threads. Um, and you can think of a thread physically as being represented by the cores in your computer, but we only have eight, maybe 16 if you're super lucky, so that's not nearly enough. So actually what's implemented is this thread pool at the virtual level, at the operating system level, where you have thousands of threads that are available. And your operating system will make sure that any two sets of operations happening on a thread are scheduled in such a way that they are as parallel as physically possible on the machine. So you can treat them as being parallel. Mm. So in other words, parallelism is a specific kind of concurrency. There's another kind of concurrency, which is the one that us in the JavaScript world know so much, and that's asynchrony 
or uh, it's often referred to by its actual implementation name, event loop concurrency. In the event loop, it's single threaded. So you just have one set of operations and anybody that wants to do something has to get at the end of the line and wait for their turn. Um, and so we're spinning things up and you know, taking something off of the event loop queue, oper uh, processing it, and then when it's finished, going back to the event loop and getting the next one. Just simply, it's like a wild true loop. It just spins forever. The reason why that's a model for concurrency is because you can take each one of those higher level tasks and break them down into multiple non-blocking asynchronous tasks, meaning that instead of saying something like request and wait for a response, you have four or five or 10 different steps and you only do the first one. And then the second one gets put at the end of the queue whenever the first one finishes. And the third one gets put at the end of the queue whenever the second one finishes. So one big task is broken up into many tiny pieces. And if all the big tasks of your system are broken up equivalently, they all interleave themselves on that single event queue so that over the same period of time, it appears as if you're making an Ajax request and response at the same time as scrolling a page. So to sum it all up, we have concurrency at the top. It is two or more things happening in the same period of time. Parallelism means at any given instant, two things are happening. Asynchrony means at any given instant, only one thing is happening, but we can have lots and lots of small little things happening and spawning off their separate steps. Software engineers are always looking to automate their work. Software automation lets us get more done with the same number of resources. Investment automation works the same way. Wealthfront is an automated investment service that relies solely on software to acquire and manage client accounts. Traditional investment services have many humans in the loop, advising clients and taking fees. The problem with these older advisory services is that the advice that these services are applying is often so systematic that a computer could give the same answer, or an even better answer. Wealthfront takes a new approach with software-driven, automated investment that provides better returns through software engineering. Go to Wealthfront.com slash SE Daily to get a special offer for our listeners. $15,000 managed for free when you open your account. Don't pay commissions and account fees. Maximize your gains with Wealthfront's Set It and Forget It investment automation. Check out Wealthfront.com slash SE Daily. It would support Software Engineering Daily, and it would also introduce you to the world of automated investments, so you can see if you like it or not. Wealthfront.com slash SE Daily. Thanks to Wealthfront for sponsoring the show. You've been a loyal sponsor, and we really appreciate it. Now let's get on with the show. And when we're talking about asynchrony, when we're talking about asynchronous JavaScript programming, we're often using promises. And a promise is a representation of a future value. So this means that if we use promises, we have to be able to reason about the behavior of our code around a future value. How do we take advantage of these time-independent values called promises? Great question. To answer that, I have to um, <laughs> have to go back to this concept of concurrency and say uh, uh, concurrency is actually perhaps the easiest thing in all of programming to do. And that will sound strange to most listeners. Um, but what I mean by that is it's incredibly easy to fire off two different things that can happen at the same time. What's difficult, what's really challenging, is coordinating the responses to those things if those things are not independent. If they're completely independent, then who cares what order they finish in? I'll just fire off both of them and then go on about my day. But if there is some sort of dependency, like if step two has to happen after step one for some particular reason, we have to coordinate. <clears throat> and as soon as we have to coordinate concurrency, that's when we need programming patterns to help us. Um, threads are a programming pattern for that in threaded languages. That's why we have mutexes and semaphores and shared resource locking and all that sort of stuff. Uh, because we don't have threads in JavaScript, at least not yet, uh, we don't have to worry about that sort of programming task, but we do need other tasks. 
The most basic of those is the callback, which is a way to wrap up the next set of operations and put it in a function and then say, do this thing later, continue my program later at this point. But we are realizing quickly that if JavaScript is going to stick around for the next 20 years, we're going to need a lot more sophisticated tools to model the, um, uh, the coordination of concurrent operations. Uh, the first of those tools is the promise. And the promise is a way to put a container around a value, that value being not necessarily ready yet. Um, so my metaphor is like ordering a cheeseburger at the counter. When you pay for the cheeseburger, it's not ready yet. Uh, they give you a receipt with an order number on it. And that receipt represents a placeholder for your future cheeseburger. Um, you can start to reason about and think about and even dream about and salivate about your cheeseburger, but you don't have it yet. So it's a placeholder. And eventually you will trade that receipt with that order number on it for your actual cheeseburger. But you don't want to reason differently about the cheeseburger based upon whether it's here or not. That is really hard. That involves reasoning about time. And I like to say that time is the most complex state in any of our applications. So if we can take programming patterns that take the time component of state out of the equation, that factor it out, hide it, abstract it, whatever, then we make our code easier to reason about. And that's exactly what a promise should be thought of as, is a putting a wrapper around a value, which means that I'm going to interact with that wrapper exactly the same, regardless of whether the value is here yet or not. I'm going to, I'm going to interact with it exactly the same, mm. which means I don't have to worry about that time component now that I have this value wrapped around it. This is inspired from other languages, like for example, E, which has a thing called futures. They're not even wrappers. They literally are the actual primitive value itself has a, has a state that it can be represented where it's not here yet. But it doesn't matter. You can still add two futures together and you get back another future that represents the addition once those are there. Um, so promises were just the way that we modeled this in JavaScript. But removing time is the first step in being able to reason about much more complex, much more concurrent systems that have these, these time in, uh, dependencies between them. And getting to that area where we can reason about our asynchronous code, we have generators also. And generators and promises can be used together to give us synchronous looking code. And it's still asynchronous in reality, Explain what that means. How does that work, and why are generators so useful in concert with promises? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll fully uh, fully state here that there's two ways of looking at this synchronous-looking async uh, world. The more common of the two that most people listening will have heard of is the uh, syntax that's coming to JavaScript eventually called async await. There's another way of modeling the same interaction that async await gives us, which is what you're referring to as generators. And I prefer that one. Um, I just actually recently wrote a, a two-part blog post about why I prefer uh, the more um, baseline generators approach. But essentially what it boils down to is this. It's a special kind of function that behaves differently, both generators and async await. There are special kinds of functions that, that behave differently than normal functions. And the specific difference is that a normal function, once it starts running, it always runs until it's finished. It never pauses in the middle. It will run and it will either finish or have some sort of error and it won't finish at all. But it's called the run to completion semantic. Generators and async await functions do not have a run to completion semantic required. Um, they are allowed to pause themselves in the middle. And the way they pause is through a special keyword. In the generator's world, that keyword is the yield keyword. In the async await, async functions world, that keyword is await. Either way, when you put that keyword on some portion of a statement, you are telling that function, pause yourself for a moment while some other stuff in the background goes about. And by pause, we mean literally just the local execution of that function, not the bigger program. So we're not blocking the whole thing, but just that line of code is going to pause and everything after it in that function is going to wait 
to, to proceed until we resume. In the generator's world, we specifically resume by uh, calling a dot next method on an iterator to start back up the generator. Hmm. In the async await world, that whole resume thing is built into the engine. So you don't need you don't need to implement that logic to do that. But in both cases, what you do is say, I have a promise that represents a future value, but I need to do something synchronously with that value. And so I need to have this little piece of my code wait for that value to come back to actually be physically present before I can go on because I have the plus operator and it only works with numbers. And so I got to wait for the number. So either with the yield keyword or with the await keyword, we're giving it a promise and saying, hey, function, I want you to pause until that promise finishes. Once it does, give me that value back and then I'll proceed. So inside of our generator or inside of our await, async await function, we can write things like x equals yield and then some function call. And even though that function call is asynchronous, that statement will pause and wait until it finishes and then do the assignment. So it gives us back synchronous looking code, even though under the covers, it's asynchronous. Mm. And the reason why this is so important <laughs> is because it does exactly what I just said with promises. It takes the time component and factors it out of what we have to think about, giving so, us code that works more naturally like our sequential brains. In your experience teaching people, what are the conceptual problems that people have with internalizing promises and generators and how this programming model works? The biggest problem that people have is they're so stuck on callbacks and they're so stuck on not really understanding uh, why callbacks are a problem. So the first thing I do when I teach asynchronous programming is I point out that this notion of callback hell that many people have heard of, um, virtually everyone that just heard me use that phrase, what conjured in their mind was deeply nested indented code. Um, nested functions instead of functions instead of functions. It turns out that callback hell um, has almost nothing to do with nesting and indentation, the way a lot of people think. In fact, there's like callbackhell.com that makes the case that it's all about nesting and indentation. I know the guy that made that website. I think he's brilliant and awesome, but I just completely disagree with him that it has anything to do with that. Instead, callback hell is two fundamental problems. And we've already kind of touched on the solutions to both of those. But the, the first fundamental problem is that uh, callbacks are not trustable, um, which means when you take a callback and pass it somewhere else, you're not in control of how that's going to be executed or how often. You may only want it to be called once. You might be expecting for it to only be called once, but the calling code that you pass it to gets to decide, and they can call it as many times as they want or never. Um, so there's a trustability component to callbacks. We lose that trustability, and that's called inversion of control. Hmm. The second problem with callbacks is that they are not linearly um, flowing through our code. The steps don't linearly flow through the code. Except that's how our brains work. Our brains are linear and sequential in nature in terms of how we plan. So callbacks fundamentally don't work the way our brains do and aren't trustable. And if you can't trust the code, then you can never reason about it being correct. Uh, there is no one solution to both of those problems, but there are two independent solutions that compose well. Promises are a trust system. So they solve the trustability problem of callbacks. And the generator uh, or the async await pattern, whichever of those flavors you like, solves the linear sequential reasoning problem. Mm -hmm. And if you put those two together, you now have a much more effective uh, baseline for thinking about asynchronous programming. Now, I should say baseline because it's really important. What I'm claiming is that understanding promises and understanding how to either work with them in generators or in async await functions, I call that level the new baseline competency for asynchronous programming. Uh, callbacks were the original one. We've now advanced to where we have to all get to that point that we can fully understand what that means and why that's useful. But that's not the end. That's just the new baseline. There's a whole bunch of other stuff that our programs do that needs lots more 
uh, higher level, more capable patterns. For and, example, and one, one yeah, one pattern that we build on this is the observable. So maybe exactly. you could explain what an observable is. I was just about to get to observable, so good segue. So a promise represents a single value, and that works whenever you're making a single action and you're expecting a single sort of result back all at the same time. But there are many things in our programs that we do that are, for example, a single request, but we're going to get back lots of results and not all of them at the same time. Uh, that is more closely, you know, you might associate that in your mind as a stream of values. For example, you load up a web page and you're listening to stock ticker updates. You're not going to just get one update. You're going to get a new update every second or every minute or whatever. So um, we can model concurrency, model asynchrony. Um, when there's going to be multiple values spread out over time, we can model that with a higher level of uh, abstraction. And the most common term that we use for that today is observable. It's basically like a stream. So if you understand stream semantics, then you're probably better than 50% of the way to understanding what an observable is. Um, but I guess the best metaphor for an observable is a spreadsheet. Um, if you think about in the old school spreadsheet uh, world, and maybe so many people don't do those these days, but if you know what a spreadsheet, how it works, you put a value in cell C3, for example, and then you have uh, a val uh, cell D5. So you've got C3 that has a value like the value 10, and then D5, you can put a value in D5, or you can say that D5 is a computed cell based upon some function of the value in C3. So you might say that D5 is C3 times two. So whatever's in C3, double it and make that the value of D5. Well, at the moment, then you're gonna see 10 and 20 and that's super easy. And then you can make another one, uh, say E1, and that's a computation of whatever is in D5. And you could say whatever's in D5, add three to it. So now we have 10 in C2 or whatever, whatever C3 is, has 10, D5 has 20, and E1 has 23. Now, as soon as I go back to C3 and change it from 10 to 11, let's say, uh, almost instantaneously, faster than what we can see, the other two are going to update. They're going to recompute. Because what we did by changing from 10 to 11 was put new data into the system, and that data propagated its way through that series of computations. Those computations happened right away, but some computations might actually take a while to do. So every step could be in its own an asynchronous step. Uh, that chain of computations where a piece of data flows from the first step to the second step, from the second step to the third, and so forth, that's how we that's what we model when we when we wire up observables we create a stream of events where there's a piece set of data that's coming in and then there's some sort of operation that we're going to perform on that data and then we have a stream that's coming out and then we can take the stream that came out and do another operation on it and get another stream and stream and stream we can also take multiple streams together and start combining them into higher order streams uh, you can zip them together or merge them or, you know, a hundred other sorts of operations. But essentially yeah, we what we're modeling is how data behaves over time. So if, if for example, you, you think about the old school map and reduce functions that most people are probably familiar with, those operations, um, we, we do those ag ag across an array, an array where all the values are already present. So if I'm mapping something, I just know I need to map all 10 values to a new set of 10 values. Think about stream operations as the same thing that we do synchronously with an array, but that we're doing asynchronously across an array that's going to get new values over time. That's basically what's happening. Totally. And we've done a few shows around this concept of reactive programming. Reactive programming is kind of the paradigm of programming around observables. Why is reactive programming gaining so much popularity today? I think it combines a few things. First off, there's there's a whole bunch of stuff that we do in our apps that just simply can't be modeled by a promise all by itself. A promise is really good at modeling single request, single response. It's not good at, at modeling responses over time. And it turns out our applications do have lots of responses over time in general. 
Um, so that's one of the big reasons. Another big reason is that it captures some of the fascination I think that we all have, or many of us have, with wanting to understand how functional programming practices can improve the understandability and the reasonability of our code. And reactive programming takes some of those uh, some of those core concepts from functional programming and applies it to this world of dealing with asynchrony, where we have a value in and we don't mutate the value, we create a new value out. So we don't mutate a stream, we create a new output stream, those sorts of things. I think combining those things gives us the power to model much more complex parts of our application more expressively. It's not that we're doing new stuff that we never did before, it's that we're doing the old stuff in better ways than we ever did before. Hmm. So uh, I want to begin to close out the conversation. Um, you are from Austin, which is where I grew up as well. And I think of Austin as this very interesting tech scene that um, has so much potential, but it's it's strange that there haven't been more big and successful tech companies out of Austin. And as somebody who is also from Austin in the tech industry, I'm just curious what your perspective on that is. Like, what is the state of the tech scene in Austin? Uh, that's a that's a bigger question. That's above my pay grade in some respects to answer. Uh, I do have some ties to the entrepreneurial scene um, here in Austin. And I would say um, maybe the best way to, to summarize a really complex history of the city is to say that it's sort of um, it's sort of a sleeper in the res- in that respect in terms of entrepreneurism. I think Austin is where an awful lot of ideas start. And it may not necessarily be the place where those ideas come to full fruition. So we see a lot of people that come up with great ideas. And then uh, after building them for a certain amount of time, they move on to the more traditional centers, like, for example, the Silicon Valleys, um, where a lot of the money is more centered. That doesn't mean Austin's not a destination. There are many, many great success stories of Austin being the destination uh, of companies that started elsewhere and decided Austin was the right place to move and, and build and grow. So there are plenty of, um, of those kinds of big success stories of companies that, that have been very successful coming out of Austin. Um, I think Austin does have some challenges, um, that have constrained entrepreneurialism. Um, one of those, yeah, there's some cultural and political challenges. I think one of the biggest things that is a problem here. Um, I've lived in Austin now about 15 years, and in the time when I first moved to Austin, the entire greater metroplex of Austin was about, I'd say maybe around 600, maybe 700,000 people at the most for the whole metroplex. At this point, the metroplex is over 2 million. So in that 15 years, we've well over doubled, approaching tripled in size. And I would say um, that amount of growth over that rapid of a period of time We have not kept up with that um, politically and culturally. Uh, There's been a lot of a lot of that, like, hold on to what makes Austin, you know, keep Austin weird, hold on to the small town mentality. So we have we we have some challenges. I mean, people have probably familiar in the news recently with the 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 latest fight in the Uber Lyft battles. Um, It doesn't look good for us that we are uh, not able to cope um, with the modern, the modern tease of transportation and, and do that on a, on a reasonable basis. So there's some things like that, that, that challenge the city, but I still believe this is the best city to be a tech person. That's why I live here. I've had plenty of opportunities to move elsewhere. And I still think this is the best city to, uh, to, to start and build stuff. Well, why is that? Are you, you're playing the long game or you just like the, the cost to, uh, atmosphere ratio or w- w- what is it exactly? What, what makes it the best tech city? Well, there's, I mean, we have plenty of great things. I, I get as a, as a teacher that travels all over the world, I actually get a chance to see an awful lot of the world and not just a lot of the U S but I mean, a lot of the whole world I've been to Australia and India and everywhere in between. So I've seen a lot of the world and I always like getting on that last plane leg to come back home to Austin There's a lot of great things, you know, simple things, but great things about Austin. We have some of the best food culture around in terms of barbecue and our our breakfast tacos and other things like that. We're world renowned for those things. Um, One of the things that I think makes Austin great is that um, there is not a lot of pretension here. 
um, I can sit down. I, I go to a group um, uh, every Friday morning that I'm in town. I go to this uh, this little totally informal group of um, folks that gather at a coffee shop. And I'm sure there's lots of cities that have things like this too, but we call our group the regulars. And all that means is that every Friday morning we show up at the same coffee shop. Other than that, there's nothing that ties us together. So there are (laughs) artists and musicians and tech people and business people and who knows, there's people like, I don't even know how that guy makes a living. It's kind of sketchy. I mean, there's just all kinds of different people that show up and, and it's, there's no advertisement. It's all word of mouth and Hey, you should come and hang out with us. But I, I show up at this group on a Friday morning and I'm sitting there, you know, having a, having a muffin and chatting with people. And I could be chatting with the CEO of a huge company and have absolutely no knowledge of it because there's no pretension of Uh, social strata like, well, you know, I'm not going to mix with the commoners. People here just love to sit down, share ideas, talk, collaborate, figure stuff out. You don't feel like every person that you're talking to has an agenda like, oh, you know, are you going to be my next investor or, you know, how can you benefit me? It's just we kind of like being a community and sharing that stuff. I I would say that's probably the best answer I could give for why I've made my vote for Austin. Right. No, I certainly get that sense too whenever I go home. And um, yeah, I don't know. Um, Interesting. Well, Kyle, thanks for coming on the show. This has been a great conversation touching on JavaScript, introductory to advanced concepts to Austin, Texas. And uh, appreciate you coming on the show. Absolutely. Thanks. It's been an honor being here. And I, uh, I hope more of your listeners will come check out the city. And I hope more of your listeners will check out JavaScript. Okay, great. Well, I'll talk to you soon. Take care.